On to one of my favorite things to teach, loops. Loops are when we repeat something. So why would we need them in coding and in our next unit, unit six? Well, a lot of times we might ask a user to enter their age. We're expecting a number. But let's say they put in a character, whatever. We want to keep asking them over and over again until they get the idea. Let's say I was six years old and you ask my age, I might type in S-I-X. So you'd want to give me a few opportunities. You just don't want to end the program and say, ah, that's not a number. <laughs> so we're going to see three loops this week. And the first one, let's start the one in the middle. It's called the while loop. And we use a while loop to repeat something several times until something becomes true. So you may say, keep repeating while what they typed in is not a number for their age. So we could keep repeating. You see how many times does it repeat? Until they get it right. It could be one time, it could be zero times, it could be 10,000 times. That's what's unique about the while loop. We also are gonna cover the for loop. The for usually identifies a certain number of times. It's not like based on a condition like the while loop. We were waiting for someone to finally type in a number and then the program will continue. That's a condition. The for loop is where you're saying, okay, I wanna print out the first 50 even numbers. Well, we know kind of how many do we want. And so we can tell the loop, go from two to 100 and keep counting by twos. So that's a for loop. The do while loop is very similar to the while loop, but it's uh, giving them a chance to um, go through the loop at least one time. I'll show you the differences here. So let's first look at a while loop. And here is a really, really sh simple flow chart. Um, we're going to keep doing this <laughs> while the condition in this case is true. We're going to do the statements inside the loop, but maybe once it's false, it kicks us outside the loop. So while they're not, you know, while it's true that it's not a number, we're going to keep asking them. Once it's finally false that it is not a number, it'll go outside that loop. The best way to learn this, of course, is to look at code. So let's do that. We're about to look at our first loop. And a loop, again, is a structure that allows repeated execution of a certain block of statements. And we call the inside of the loop, the loop body, it's a block of statements. It's going to require braces and there's going to be some kind of iteration, um, at least maybe one execution of any loop. So let's look at that in code. So first we're going to look at a while loop and let's get up to speed here of what's going on. So we have an integer that is going to be our counter. Think of a counter as it's gonna count maybe one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's an integer. We're gonna have a constant that's set as a final. I think everybody got that right on the test. <laughs> And um, we have the upper limit. I have it in all caps because it is a constant. We're gonna go up to count up to 12 and that's gonna be the final number. So we're gonna first print out something right now counting to, in this case, 12. So we're gonna set the counter to one in line eight. And let's look at line nine. This area from line nine to line 13 is our loop structure and this is the while loop. Lines 11 and 12 would be the body of the loop. I guess we could really say 10 through 13, but you get the idea here, the statements inside the loop. So let's see what this while is doing. While always has its condition at the beginning of the loop, important. Catch that again, while always has the condition at the beginning of the loop. So let's look at our condition. If this condition, what's in the parentheses, must have parentheses, is true, we're gonna go inside the loop. If this condition is false, we're gonna skip out of the loop. So let's look. While the counter is less than or equal to limit, let's go look at our numbers. So the counter is one at this time. 
Is it less than or equal to 12? Yeah, one is less than or equal to 12 for sure. So we're gonna come down here and remember all we've counted so far is counting to 12. So here's our first counter statement. We're gonna print one and a space. Then the counter is going to get incremented by one. We're adding one. So if counter was one, one plus one is two. Now counter is two, everyone. You might wanna hold your fingers up as we go through this. Now it comes back here and goes back up to see if it should stay in the while loop. If it's true, it's gonna stay in here. So now is two less than or equal to limit? Well, yeah, two is less than 12. So it's gonna print two, put a space, now go up to three, and you're probably starting to understand, we're gonna go three, print three, go up to four, four is less than 12, print four, four plus one is five, five. Let's finally get to the moment that we printed 11, okay? So we've been through this loop 11 times. So we just printed 11 and put the space. 11 plus one is 12. Counter at this moment is now 12. Comes back up and it goes, is 12 less than or equal to 12? Well, that's still true. So it does print the 12, counter becomes 13, but when counter comes back up to line nine, as it loops back around or iterates again, now 13 is less than or equal to 12. Well, that's finally false. So it does not print 13, and it comes out here and pushes off the line. Let's go ahead and look at our run. So it printed, Counting to 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 11, 12, and that's because of the space. So that's a really good example of our while statement. So now that you've seen some code, let's look back at this flowchart. In a while loop, the condition is first. If it's true, it goes through the body or the statements inside the loop repeatedly, but the moment it becomes false, it does not go in the body anymore and goes outside the while loop. So a couple new terms here. Uh, of course, in a while loop, the keyword is while. There's, there, it's always followed by that Boolean expression in the parentheses that's true. If you continue with the loop, false, you kick back out of it. Technically, a while loop could be a single statement. If you have a single statement, just like the if, you do not need curly braces, but typically you have more than one statement in there. Uh, so you probably will have that block surrounded by curly braces. And two terms I want to go over. There's something called a definite or a counted loop. This is when the programmer knows exactly how many times. That's going to be a for loop. We haven't done that yet. But an indefinite loop is the programmer may not be able to predict how many iterations, especially if you're asking the user for input, like what is your age? So a while loop is typically an, a, an indefinite loop, unless like in the program you just saw, we could pretty much see if we left it as is, it's always going to run 12 times. <laughs> but typically we don't know that. So we initialize that loop with a control variable. And in our last program, that was the counter. It was, that was our loop control variable. That's the one that's incrementing and that will determine when we're going to stop. While the loop control variable does not pass a limiting value, the program continues to execute the body of a while loop. So this brings up another term, it's called an infinite loop. That means you could, if you never had like counter equals counter plus one, it would get stuck that counters always one and the loop would never end and that is possible and you'll probably have to hit almost like control alt delete to make your code stop because it's stuck in there. So be careful with uh, infinite loops here. Here is another one here real quick. Um, in this case, we have one to 11 and it keeps on going. Remind you here, this is almost identical to our last one. L, uh, in this case, LCV, um, our, our loop, here, uh, con loop control variables, what that stands for, um, is in this case going to keep repeating until they get to the limit of 11. So LCV is our, it's truly our loop control variable. Um, and again, infinite loop is a loop that never ends and it can result from a mistake in the wild loop. 
Try not to write these intentionally. Well, obviously. <laughs> so, and here is an example of a um, infinite loop. And technically on this one, they wouldn't have to have braces, but um, good idea to have them. So while four is greater than two, well, four is forever gonna be greater than two, it's forever true. So it's gonna print out, hello, 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 well, forever, until you hit Control, Alt, Delete. And another way to exit an infinite loop instead of hitting Control, Delete to break everything, you could just hold down Control and then either press C or break. All of those will stop the loop. So if we were to look at this, um, this is writing a definite while loop, not an uh, indefinite while loop. This one actually starts as one less than three, it's true. And this, the loop control is being altered. So it's gonna count and change so it won't go on forever. So let's look at this. I'm gonna stop for a second and let you think, how many times would hello print? I hope you came up with the answer twice because as soon as it gets to three, the counter loop count, it will no longer keep counting. So far, you've just seen a while loop count to whatever number, but let's see it more in captivity, in real life, how it might be used. Now, before I dig into the program, let's just quickly look at this while statement. It's in braces, the body of the loop. Our condition is, is response equal to one? I want to remind you here, this is checking to see if it's one, if that's true. Um, don't put a single equal sign or response will become one. And of course, well, it'll always be true then. <laughs> So let's kind of look at this program and see if it's written properly or not. So this is called bank balance. We're gonna have whatever your bank balance is a double because it's probably has pennies at the end. We're gonna ask them for their response. It's gonna be an integer. We don't have a value yet. And this is year one in your bank account. So that has been assigned. We're gonna have an interest rate of 3% or 0 0.03, that's a double, it's standard at this bank. Although that's typically not true. <laughs> so we're gonna first ask them on the keyboard to enter their initial bank balance. So let's say you have $500 in your bank balance. With everything going on, that would be great, right? So we now would ask whatever they type in, um, how long that is, gets assigned to the balance. So the double is, now we've turned it into a double. Don't forget everything typed in from the keyboard is a string. We're converting it to a double here, assigning it to balance, which is a double. And we're also, do you want to see next year's balance? What we're gonna do is figure out with interest what your new balance is. And if you wanna see that, enter one for yes, or any other number for no. So if whatever they type in here is gonna be assigned to response. Now, if their response is equal to one, let's say it is. So they wanna see what their balance is gonna be in a year. Remember we put in $500. So now um, after we do one, we'd now compute the new balance. We'd figure out what is 3% of $500. Um, so that's per year, and we'd add that. So let's say 3% uh, of $500 is, let's say, $15. $15 plus the original balance of $500. Our new balance after one year in the bank is going to be $515. Woohoo! And we would print out after year one, if you remember, year is one, at 3% interest rate, basically, interest rate, balance is now. $515. Now we're gonna increment it up a year. Why? Do we, it's, we're gonna ask the question, so now year is two at this moment. Hold your fingers up, two. Do you wanna see the balance at the end of the year? If they type in one for yes, then the loop is going to go back up, hold on, and start again there. I'm gonna go back and get that again. 
So if they pick in one, it's going to do it again. So we have to ask for the keyboard response again. If we don't put these three lines, enter one for yes, um, other number for no, next integer, it would be stuck in here forever because we would have no way to get them to type in any other value. So let's say they say one again. We come back up. The response, is it still true that it's one? It is. So now we have the new balance, which is $515. We'd find 3% of that, add it to the 515, and we have a new balance. And we'd print after year two, the interest rate at 3%, the balance is whatever the new balance is. We'd now get up to year three, but if we no longer want to see this run again, let's just enter any other value, zero, whatever, and let's say you put in a zero for no. When it comes back up, the response is now zero. It's not equal to one, so it ends the program in this case. So this is kind of a more typical way you're going to see the while loop work. And you've probably seen applications at your bank. Do you want to pay uh, another balance or you know off your credit card or something like that over and over again? Before we look at more while loops or for loops, I want to show you that Java has a couple time-saving elements for coding. For example, in the program we wrote earlier, we wrote counter equals counter plus one semicolon. It's pretty long. So if you ever just want to add one to a variable, that's of course an integer, we could just say C++. Let's look at this code. We have this variable that's C. It's private. It's zero. We're going to go into this first method called increment. And if you see C++, uh, what it would do is add one to this value. And so really now it's not zero anymore. It's one. We could also go into something called C minus minus. It would subtract one. So now it's one, if we go back, it would be zero. And if you return that back, we'd return a zero. So let me show you some of these time saving ways to do some of this. They also have ways to accumulate. You can add, let's say you're doing five, 10, 15, 20. You could have a plus equal site statement that adds and assigns at the same time, subtracts, multiplies, divides. And if you remember from the first chapter, it does percentage. So if I wanted to add five, I can, for example, use this shortcut way of saying C plus equals five. Let's say C was originally zero. If you would come across this next statement, it would just add five to C very quickly. So a quick and easy way to increment. So let's look at a program that uses these increments, but there's something a little tricky in here that I wanna show you. It's not as basic as it would look. So we have our little program in here. We start off with integer my number and answer. So we're going to have two different variables here. They're not assigned on line five yet, but line six says my number has now been assigned to 42. The answer doesn't have a value really just yet. So we print out at the start, my number is 42. Now let's look at this. We have this plus plus my number. Hmm. Well, if you remember what I showed you earlier, we had something like C++. Now I have the plus plus in front. The plus plus does add one, but the question is, when does it add one? There's two ways to do an increment that adds one. It can be something called a prefix increment, and there's another one called a postfix increment. Line nine is an example of a prefix increment. So what that means is, I want you to add one first to the value of 42, so then assign it to answer. So in this case, it would be 42 plus one, or one plus 42 is 43. So when we go to run it after prefix, my number is, my number, let's see if it prints out 43. So we go to run it, and it says at start, my number is 42. After prefix increment, my number is 43. And 
Oh, we haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> so let's go to line 12. Um, system out um, print line, and the answer is, notice we did make the answer 43. So here's something interesting. Line 9, what it's doing here, it's changing my number first to 43, then assigning it to answer, which is also 43. You say, well, that's what I would expect it to do. Well, so far, so good. So that's why it says after prefix and increment, my number is 43 and my answer is 43. Now, remember as we go into line 13 that we're resetting it now back to 42. So my number is back to its original 42. Now, it says I'm now starting over and my number is 42. So here we go, starting over, my number is 42. Now I'm about to confuse you, so really, really listen up here. Everyone look at line 16. Let me make it super large so we can see that pretty easily. This is called a postfix. It's different than line 9 that had a prefix. What this meant in the prefix is to add one and change my number from 42 to 43, so that changes in memory, 43, and assign it to answer, which is 43. What does it do down here? This is actually called a postfix increment. What this is actually going to do is my number is, in this case, going to be originally 42. It's going to assign it to answer. And so 42 gets assigned to answer without the plus one. But as it goes to leave this line onto line 17, it does at that moment increment my number by one. Let me say that again. So how a postfix works is it does this plus plus last, not first. So it assigns 42 to answer. Answer in the rest of this program is gonna be set to 42. But it does this postfix last. So it now adds one to my number. My number is now up to 43, but catch this, answer is still 42. So after postfix increment, my number, let's look down here, is 42. Here it is, sorry, <laughs> let's do that again. After postfix increment, my number is 43 and my answer is 42. So let's say that when you do a plus plus in front of a number, it changes that number in memory first and assigns that to the answer. In line 16, we assign what my number was to answer, and then it increments my number by one in up. So read through this program once again, stop the video, make sure you catch that little point because if not, it's going to be confusing as you write code.